All right. Hello, Matt. Thanks for, so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Good morning, Chris. I'm pretty good. I've, uh, I've had a couple of cups of coffee uh, and I'm raring to go. Beautiful. So, so I, I'm late to uh, your podcast, Decoding Gurus. So real quick, uh, I think I think a lot of people from my audience are well aware of who you are, but can you can you give a little bit of your background, your field of study, and all that kind of stuff, and then a brief description of what your podcast is all about? Sure thing. Yeah. Well, me, uh, I'm a professor at uh, Central Queensland University in Australia. Uh, I've been doing that for ooh just over ten years. Um, uh, before that, I was uh, a research uh, scientist mainly in a ver variety of places. I'm currently in a psychology department, but I've worked all over the place. I've worked in a robotics lab in Japan, and I've worked mm. in, um, in sort of atmospheric and, um, and marine sciences at the CSIRO, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in uh, Germany. Uh, so I've done a bunch of stuff because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, Chris and I, um, that is... Um, um, uh, Chris Kavanagh, um, he, he's, he's an anthropologist um, uh, with Oxford University, who's based in Japan. Um, he, he and I got together on Twitter, um, well, probably just over a year ago. Um, we, we'd known each other for a little while, but we found ourselves talking more and more about the same sort of set of characters. And we felt like we'd sort of, we, we kept seeing the same kind of features crop up. Um, mm. and, and we didn't know how to group these people or how to define what it is we were talking about. And we eventually landed on the term uh, secular gurus, mm. right? Because th they weren't, you know, religious or spiritual necessarily, but they certainly did have like, like this sort of um, idiosyncratic and, you know, um, we sometimes say heterodox, but they're, 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 they're not sort of orthodox characters. They're, they're, and they have like a message, you know, a particular view of the world, mm -hmm. these they, uh, particular insights that they're sharing with people. They often have strong views about, you know, how we should be living our lives or changing society. Um, you know, not like your typical academic or, or intellectual type person or a journalist who might have strong views on a particular issue, like, you mm -hmm. know, what we should do about policy on Syria or something like that, but sort of these big encompassing kind of, <laughs> kind of views. Um, sure, they're often engaged in like culture war type political stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, we intended to write um, some articles, some academic articles on this, because that's what, that's what academics do. Yeah. Um, but to get our thoughts in order, we, we, th because we're still figuring it out, I suppose. We thought, well, look, um, let's 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 record us talking about this stuff, and we'll we'll do a podcast, and we'll sort of it was kind of a way to procrastinate, I suppose, <laughs> instead of writing. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, so this podcast, decoding the gurus, um, ended up um, taking on a bit of a life of its own. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's crazy. Like I said, I was I was late to the uh, the decoding gurus podcast but I felt like I, I started binging it because I have felt like I'm crazy right like you've seen me I, I know you've read a couple of my Substack pieces but I'm like is anybody else noticing what's going on right <laughs> like <laughs> just there's these same patterns they're speaking to the same people they're playing into the same things and you know something I, I, I discussed was there's a certain group of people and a lot of them are people that you guys discuss where you could take just about any topic and you'll know where they stand on it before before even talking to them. And I think that's a little bit strange. So, you know, why why do you from you know all the all the people you guys have covered, why do you think why do you think it is? I know the word narcissism gets thrown around quite a bit, but it's often like, oh, we're seeing the world differently than everybody else, which is also weird to me because there's millions of people who listen to them collectively. So clearly there's a group of people who do agree with you, right? So how mm. different is your opinion and all that? But what do you, what do you think is driving a lot of this? Uh, yes, I guess there's a couple of ways to answer that. I mean, one way to answer it is in terms of what's driving these characters themselves, you know, mm -hmm. like psychologizing them and trying to figure out what their motivations are and what makes them tick. Um, and um, the other way to think about it is, well, why, what's, what's the market? Like, what's the need? You know, what, what's, uh, what, what are, 
what are all of us who's consuming, you know, in, information on, on the internet and stuff like that, what, what pulls us towards particular sources rather than others? Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe starting with the last one, I guess, well, first of all, it's obviously the internet, right? That's a big deal. This, yeah. this kind of thing, like they're always kind of self-help gurus. They're always, you know, idiosyncratic characters. I mean, we've covered people like Carl Sagan on, on our yeah. podcast, who, who I love, by the way, but I'd still describe him as a bit of a, secular guru right um just just not a particularly toxic one Um, Mm -hmm. because as well as talking about black holes and things like that he also did sort of connect that with a kind of a like a a world view one Mm. i quite like and i think is quite healthy but still it's kind of guru-esque um so i think we're all attracted to um people um providing some sort of meaning and doing that kind of sense making that um you know that's a that's a phrase that's entered the lexicon now sense making mm-hmm. um, um but that is what they kind of do they um and the other thing too i guess is that they do establish that personal rapport you know there's this thing called parasociality which um mm-hmm. anyone who does podcasts or is involved um uh, you know uh, is now familiar with which again is not necessarily a toxic thing or a bad thing i think i think it can be can be quite good but we do develop a kind of a one-way relationship um, with characters who are doing, you know, extended podcasts, or long videos on YouTube, and we've spent so much time with them. And there is a, a communication of sort of frankness and honesty and directness. And what you're hearing from this person isn't filtered by some editorial line and, and isn't, is, isn't filtered by the sort of, you know, the 10 minute sound grabs on CNN or something mm-hmm. like that. It, it feels much more authentic. And so I, I guess we're looking for that as well, authenticity. So, um, yeah, as well, okay, one final thing is there's that, that great leveling. Yeah, that great leveling. Like it, it, it used to be that, um, you know, to, to, to get a, an audience to, and to write a book or something like that, you'd, you'd have to get, get, you know, you'd have to have a publisher and all this stuff or, or to have this a platform in order to be broadcast into hundreds of millions of people. You needed to be, you know, part of a, some sort of, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know um, mainstream media. And you, again, you'd have editors and so on. So there's this great leveling, which means everybody has an opportunity to uh rocket to some kind of celebrity or or reach a really huge audience so it it's kind of you know like richard dawkins idea of memes and so on it's mm-hmm. kind of like a petri dish right a hot to create this hyper competitive uh environment for the most effective memes right the, the most charismatic characters yeah you know, the 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 most um appealing intuitively appealing and emotionally appealing ideas to get sort of selected for and get set straight to to the top. So um, that's where I think the appeal is coming from on the demand side. Um, but I guess the personality and the character of the gurus is probably a separate question. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's discuss that a little bit because I I am oddly obsessed with just self deception and denial. And maybe it's because I'm a uh, I'm a recovering drug addict. I got sober in 2012, and there's a lot of denial and self deception. Like, oh no, everything's fine. I got this under control, right? And you know, it's part of human nature. We we lie to ourselves all the time, right? And I love reading and just trying to understand that. So the big question is, and I and I, I I do appreciate how how you guys are very careful, right? Like you try not to be like this is a nefarious, terrible person, right? But when it comes to this authenticity that people are drawn to, okay, when these, like I said, you can see these patterns, like, for example, I I was just, so Jordan Peterson's top of mind, I was just listening to your guys' episode about Jordan and Brett's uh, conversation, but like Jordan Peterson, right, he's a, you know, psychology, he kind of blew up for some of his views on trans stuff, but also all his self-help type of things, but like without even knowing anything, I'm like, I think I know where Jordan Peterson's going to stand on vaccines, mandates, and all that stuff. And boom, I start seeing him tweet about it, right? Mm-hmm. So when it comes to that authenticity and this self awareness or uh, even self deception, I, I, I don't know. How do you guys view this? Like, or how do you view this? Like, do you think they're intentionally like, kind of like, oh, I'm going to say this. I know it's going to get a lot of likes. I know people are going to tune into this episode. I know it's going to draw on an audience. Or do you think that they truly believe what they're saying? It's so difficult. And I like, I always try to give them the benefit of the doubt, but it's so hard. Like, I'm like, there's yeah. no way they believe this bullshit. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, it is. It is hard to wrap your head around. Um, like the issue that that I struggle with is is when you see some of these, um, you know, anti anti vaccine um, 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 characters who who are smart people. You know, mm-hmm. they've got a research track record. They've they've got they've got relevant degrees and so on. And it's like you cannot possibly be so. <laughs> ignorant as not to be able to understand these you know quite basic statistics you know there are some questions that are pretty difficult like you know scientific empirical questions that are difficult to get your head around yeah. but the the question around do vaccines work at preventing hospitalization and death that's not a particularly complicated one so so what's going on um look i i think the way to to, to resolve it is that is that first of all, very very smart people can delude themselves very badly. Mm-hmm. That's that's one of the main things. Um, you know, there's even this phrase called noble noble laureate disease or noble prize. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you know, so even a noble laureate it will will, some, will <laughs> more, so often seems to be found saying something like homeopathy will cure cancer or something like that. Um, they've so people change people go down rabbit holes people can have really weird opinions about about issues that are not connected with their main field of study and um and conspiracy theories and political polarization can affect anyone so i think i think okay so that's sort of the more general stuff but on a personal level i think the the pull of attention yeah and getting thousands and thousands of people Mm -hmm you know clapping their hands together praising you for being just just absolutely wonderful if if you're if you're a person who is susceptible to to that and people who are somewhat further along the narcissistic spectrum are extremely sensitive to praise then that is taken as a confirmation that you are right that you're on Mm -hmm. the right track um, and you can sort of, um, you know, drink, get high on your own supply, I think. So, so the, yeah. the, like there's, there's one particular character, James Lindsay, who's a good example of this, yeah. right? Um, many people might be aware of him. And it's not particularly controversial to say that he's changed, man. Yeah. yeah. Like, it, it, like he may have deep down always been like this, but he, ha- he is someone who has clearly changed his entire mm-hmm. uh, sort of presentation. Um, and he has followed the attention, you know, he has followed the praise. And, and, and as he's done that, he's, he's grown his audience. He's probably lost a lot of people on the more reasonable side of the spectrum and gained a lot of the full on partisan crazy people. But from, from his subjective point of view, he's just, he's getting praised and being told that he's right and he's, mm-hmm. he's on the right track and he's saving the world. And he's, fa- he's a fantastic person again and again and again. So I think the, um, it's like the tail wagging the dog. We, we, you know, um, one of the things that we um, have talked about with a philosopher, Tai Nguyen, was really interesting, which is like the degree to which you have audience capture and the audience driving it as much as the guru themselves. Yeah, yeah no, it, I, I think that's where I empathize a little bit too, because in 2019, uh, my YouTube channel was just exploding, like blowing up, fat, just faster pace than I could imagine. And yeah, I started getting high on my own supply, right? And and it's it was hard to stick to my, you know, the reasons I started making content and everything like that. And like you're saying, like, the audience can start driving your content, you know, what's working, you see what people are talking about. And then you start to craft your content around that, rather than what you actually believe. And uh, it took me a while to step back and realize that that was happening to me. And I think that's why I try to like empathize. But yeah, in the instance of James Lindsay, there's so many people who are, I'm just like, okay, maybe you don't realize it, but he seems like a, a very different case <laughs> where I'm like, no, cause he, you know, he gets happy about his own trolling and all these other things. So I'm like, all right, I think you're very intentional with what you're doing, but um you know, I, I'm curious with this and, you know, looking at this and kind of analyzing it and you and Chris originally thinking about writing a paper or something on this, like, what, what would that look like? What, what, you know, now that you guys have some episodes and stuff, it's been over a year, you have all this time uh, under your belts, like, what would a research paper about this guru or IDW phenomenon kind of look like? Yeah. Um, so it would. Um, we've got more than enough material now to write yeah. a bevy of papers, and and we do. We promise we will. We will. We will. Um, but um, 
um, you know, I could, in terms of the sort of an academic -y type paper, um, what we would do, what we need to do is, is basically go through these, these facets or dimensions or aspects of gurus that we think we've identified and basically run through those and look at how these different features often seem to turn up in varying degrees in the same people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I've hinted at some of those already. So you've got this, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some of the names just to give you a hint about some of these things. So no, this, um, we, we, they're they're tongue-in-cheek names. Um, so galaxy brainness, that kind of, that kind of, um, you know, have, having this polymathic ability across all these different um, fields. I mean, you know, Brett and Heather Weinstein, for instance, they've, they, they, they take their purported expertise in evolutionary biology and and take that as the the secret the the, the key that yeah. unlocks pretty much every question in in life um um this this cultish kind of feature which you kind of talked about that kind of interplay and you see a lot of them do this kind of gatekeeping and management like they'll they'll pray like you know if they're uh, they have disciples or, or fans who are extremely loyal and and agree with everything and attack the people who disagree um you know, then they'll get showered with praise and, and, and so on. There is, there is some social manipulation at play. Um, but look, some of the really key stuff that um, is kind of crucial to them is that they're almost all um, anti-establishment. Mm. Yeah, you're not going to find a guru who says, yes, the, um, you know, the, the CDC and um, the NIH, uh, NIH sometimes makes mistakes, isn't always correct, but, you know, broadly speaking, this, they're correct and this is why, right? And, um, you know, I'm, this is where Carl Sagan, for instance, is not a toxic guru because he would um, provide an accurate view, say, of the current understanding of astronomy and so on. But the, the current crop of secular gurus really make their mark and really define a niche for themselves by setting themselves in opposition to the establishment sources of knowledge, right? It could be the universities, which apparently are completely corrupted by, by wokeness and yeah. left-wing ideology, so you can't trust them. It, um, it could be the government, which is in the pocket of big business and, you mm -hmm. know, is, is out to get you or whatever. So that's connected with the conspiracy theories, right? Most of them do indulge in one degree or another in, in these um, um, conspiracy theories. And, you know, the, the, the recent um, controversy with Joe Rogan and, and his guests, McCulloch and Malone, like the conspiracy theories outlined there and fully um, supported um, by Joe Rogan, it must be said, are that shit crazy, right? Yeah. According, according, to those, according to those conspiracy theories, um, Fauci and Johns Hopkins and other actors, maybe in collaboration with the Chinese, deliberately created and released this virus yeah. um, in order to put the population into a state of fear and suppressed life-saving mm -hmm. uh, treatments like ivermectin um, and hydroxychloroquine um, in order to force everyone to, well, first of all, control them generally, but also force them to take vaccines, which don't work and will also kill you <laughs> Yeah, for some nefarious purposes that are unspecified. Now, that's an example of a conspiracy theory. Now, they're not always that extreme, but you'll find in most of the gurus, there are elements of conspiracy theories. So I could go on, but um, I, uh, you know, I might stop there and just say, you know, you can see there that there are, there are anecdotal sort of evidence i suppose from from the various gurus that we need to collect together and just present yeah and we can also relate this to you know the academic the psychological the sociological literature because because we know a lot about how conspiracy theories work about how cults work mm -hmm. um, about how narcissism works so yeah yeah it should be interesting yeah it almost seems like building like a personality profile right <laughs> like you know yeah. and like these warning signs to look out for but you know this is something that actually just came to me because yesterday i i, I was recording an episode with michael boxar who uh, wrote a book on innovation right uh human frontiers and talks about stagnation and innovation and all that and i'm curious because they're, they're just kind of you know with these gurus there's this like anti-establishment and you know the galaxy brain myth like i'm thinking i'm looking at things differently and you know one would argue that that's where some of the greatest achievements have come from right it's just having these wild and crazy ideas so where where do you think you know like you're a researcher too like where do you think that balance comes in with 
you know, having those really out there, like I'm thinking different type ideas and then, you know, just, just being totally off the rails. Like uh, something that I've, I've noticed that you guys, uh, you guys see as a pattern with a lot of these gurus is, uh, you know, I, whether it was like Gad Sad or like Brett or whoever it is, they're presenting something as though it's like this profound, nobody's ever thought of this. And they're just wording it in a weird way. But it's like, no, this is something that we already know of. And it's been around for ages. So, so yeah, where, where's that balance between innovative ideas, you know, so we can move forward with technology, research, whatever, and then like, just being one of these gurus who's just not even aware of we are, we're already, we already have this stuff, you know? Yeah. No, it's actually, it's very much true. Like the, one of the best, like we're almost figuring out like a, it's almost like a guidebook on how to be a guru, but one of the best tricks that you can do is, is take some like relatively well known, like within like some, some insight or some theory from within a discipline that might not be publicly that well known. All right. Put it into your own words. All right. And, and around that, maybe add a bit of flair, right? It could be a bit crazy, sort of reachy type, unsupported stuff just to make it a bit sexier and then present it as your own thing that you've, you've discovered, right? Mm -hmm. People will eat that up with a spoon. Um, it'll be kind of true. Yeah, the part that's true will not be new. And the part mm -hmm. that isn't true, <laughs> I'm sorry, that, that is new won't be true, but that's okay. The whole thing will sell fantastically and that gets done a lot. Um, look, um, you know, people like the uh, Heather and Brett Weinstein explicitly compare themselves to Galileo, right? So that they, they mm -hmm. do do these. Um, so those comparisons are, and they make that argument, right? That this, um, that they that you need these people that are that are that are brave enough, adventurous enough, open minded enough, right? To to explore the new horizons, um, and implicit in this is that the the conventional people people who are not gurus are, are somehow constrained within this very narrow window and are too mm. afraid to explore new ideas or debate ideas, right? Now, that is, in, I feel, largely untrue. Um, there is, like, for instance, let's take the lab leak um, hypothesis surrounding um, um, COVID. Now, that that is something that that is, that's a topic about which that is said, right? Yeah. That, it, that, that is not being considered properly within respectable circles and, and and you need these outlier people to sort of push that forward um that's really not true <laughs> like like there have been heaps of heaps of articles published by standard researchers considering the evidence like it's taught it's debated and been talked about at length mm -hmm. within within normal scientific medical circles um what's not done is, is treating some sort of random little thing as as this smoking gun and drawing these unsupported inferences and basically pushing um, a particular perspective that is not supported by the evidence. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a you can see that it can be a bit of a trick, you know, to present the orthodoxy as being, you know, uh, you know, um, have this tunnel vision yeah. and so on. And uh, so it's a bit of a trick there. Um, Look, and we actually wrote, um, Chris and I wrote an article um, called You're Probably Not Galileo in response <laughs> to uh, Brett, <laughs> Brett and Heather. Um, because, you know, the thing to remember is that, you know, big advances in a discipline, uh, especially today, but even back in the day when, you know, you could be a kind of a natural philosopher and be kind of like, like, like Newton and kind of be a bit of an expert of, at everything because mm -hmm. um, we knew so much less. Right. Yeah. Now the, the boundaries of knowledge have expanded so much that those people don't really um, exist. Right. You need to mm -hmm. specialize because, um, yeah. Um, now, but even but even then, as of as today, like these, you know, big, you know, earth shattering insights and big new strides forward are not made mm -hmm. by someone sitting at home in front of their microphone like us. Yeah. Right. They're not they're not revealed on a podcast. Right. Yeah. They they they're not done sitting in your armchair just speculating about stuff. Right. They they they're done by working scientists. Right. Um. Yeah. So, um. You know. And so ninety nine times out of hundred, well, more than that. It's hard to say how often. Like like every physicist gets, um. You know, um. Crazy stuff sent to them by cranks who think <laughs> that they've figured out a theory of everything. Right? Yeah. Like like Eric Weinstein claims to have with his um uh, you know whatever it's called I've forgotten it, um you know 
most, you know, so anyway, um, yeah, so I guess that's my, that's my rejoinder to that. I, I like, you know, has, as someone who works in, you know, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a researcher and I've worked across a bunch of different fields yeah. in, in the, in the softer sciences, as well as the harder sciences, uh, there's heaps of innovation going on. Yeah. There's yeah. heaps of debate. Um, there's heaps of heterodoxy. Um, the way that science and academia and various institutions are portrayed in by the gurus and in some of the popular media is just not accurate. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Just you know, completely outside the realm of this topic, kind of. Uh, I've been trying to figure out why people love like Ayn Rand, uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy and. All, all this individualism. And I've noticed when reading those books, a lot of these like uh, uh, big, you know, innovations are, it, it's all attributed to like one person, right? Like, for example, a Apple's all booms, uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, then there's Jeff Bezos, there's Bill Gates. And, you know, I'm like, no, this, this isn't the real story. There's, there's teams of people. There's a lot of people. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, what is it? it's, uh, Isaac Newton's quote, like, you know, if I see further, it's only by standing on the shoulders of giants. Right. But we like that narrative of, oh, this one person. And yeah, like you said, like with, with, with the realm of knowledge that we have now, someone's not just going to be sitting there and just like, aha, I figured this out with nobody else as when you have just yeah. so much, you know, uh, not enough funding, but funding going into research, all these people, yeah. you know, toying around with ideas. But yeah. um, something else I, I've noticed too is there's this kind of like closed loop, right? With these gurus where they're all kind of like talking to each other. And uh, I think a great example, you have like Dr. Uh, Carl, uh, um, well, Robert Malone and then uh, uh, McCullough. Like they're like, oh yeah, I was talking to like Malone's like, I was talking to McCullough and he agrees with this. And McCullough's like, yeah, I was talking to Malone. And it's like, okay and then they 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 have this kind of delusion that these other people are challenging them when it's really just a bunch of yes men and they're all just kind of feeding off each other but uh you know i wanted to ask you too uh like how like how do you and chris make sure that you avoid some of these things especially if you were going to write a paper on this for example right how do you uh know that you're getting the proper type of feedback and someone's challenging you correctly you know what i mean because this is something that i try to you know work on when i'm going through my own like thoughts and everything like that it's like i don't want people agreeing with me just because you know mm. yeah um well firstly you're right um you know like i actually um you know broadly speaking and uh, i was you know positively disposed to the whole sort of heterodox movement you know i was almost joined um the heterodox thing um you know local chapter or whatever in australia because I, yeah. I generally like the idea you know philosophers too you know they they like the idea of like um being a bit like peter singer who mm -hmm. who is known for these you know playing with completely controversial ideas like you can't say that that's I, I, you, yeah you get, i love that guy yeah uh, you know like that's that's thought like it may be it you know it, it may be not directly correct but it it's thought provoking and challenge and challenges you. So in principle, the idea is great. But what we see in practice is that these characters, you know, do align 100%, it seems on so many on so many issues. Um, and they, they talk so much about being the ones who are willing and able to have those tough conversation and those debates. Mm -hmm. But then they spend three hours just clapping each other on the back and telling each other how wonderful they are and how they're saving Western civilization with this conversation. Um, so um, how do we avoid it? Well, I mean, one of the things we do is we is we we have a like a right of reply for, for anyone we criticize. They are welcome on the podcast and they get to say um, their piece. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so and this is even true of people we haven't covered, so people who wanted to criticize us. So, for instance, we had on um, a chap called Daniel Harper, who um, is quite a strong sort of um, uh, communist, I guess you would say, yeah. uh, you know, very much politically from that end. And from, from his point of view, we were kind of our criticism of gurus was too was too faint. You know what I mean? We, mm. we weren't calling them out for the for the, you know, the structural um um, racist, etc. We, we weren't calling them out for political stuff. We we're calling them out on sort of intellectual mm. grounds, I guess you would say. So he had a problem with us, so we had him on, and he he spoke at length about about his issues, and we tried to respond. We had Sam Harris took us up on 
on on that invitation. And you know, if anyone has listened to that, you'll know that you know he got he got his airtime, right? He yeah. He's, he he took up most of the time and and um and pushed back very hard. Um, I think um. One one of the ways we're trying to avoid getting sucked into any of those little rabbit holes, because I think it's always possible, um, is to try to avoid the political lens. You know, like yeah. you can criticize a lot of these people on political grounds. And Chris and I try to be very upfront about look, this is where our political sympathies lie. They're not very interesting. We're like yeah. <laughs> left wing liberals, <laughs> like a lot of people. Um, but they they like we generally do not our motivation is genuinely not political, right? And so we we do we we'll have problems with people across the spectrum, um, and you know for what we think is unclear thinking, um, deceptive language, uh, mm. and so on. So, but you know, having having said all that, you know, I definitely can see the, you know, most of our audience is you know doesn't don't like sort of right wing reactionary type stuff. So if we cover a right wing reactionary type person. And we'll get lots of cheers and you know um, claps yeah. and so on. Whereas if we you know we might be covering someone who is intellectually really not good, but if they're kind of politically on on the left, maybe they wouldn't be so enthusiastic. So, look, I don't have a good answer for you. I guess the proof is in the pudding. I mean, be skeptical. Like anyone yeah. listening to any of us uh, should be skeptical and not assume that. Um, we're always managing to do that because none of us are special. None of us have like a privileged kind of bird's eye view on everything. Yeah. We're all vulnerable to it. Um, us as much as anyone. We're a couple of mediocre academics with a podcast. That's it. <laughs> no, I, I always tell people because I have a lot of books in rotation. I always try to keep one in rotation, just reminding me of my own, my own biases and thinking errors and stuff like that. Like, uh, because even like Daniel Kahneman, right? He's like, hey, I'm not invincible <laughs> to these things either. Like these things happen. But um, I, I, I wanted to, you know, branch off of that whole like kind of closed loop and, you know, patting each other on the back because these uh, these gurus, they do present themselves as like, oh, hey, like, hey, let's have a conversation. I just want to have a conversation. And uh, I, think, I think we might've chatted about this a little on Twitter, but uh, from my experience, there is no conversation. So it, it's actually been guys you've covered like, Nassim Taleb, I asked him a question about one of his opinions and he called me like a fucking idiot and he blocked me, right? <laughs> like, uh, Gad Sad, his recent book, uh, I review all the books I read. I wrote, you know, I wrote what I thought was a fair review. Uh, I even like took out the word grifter in one point. I tried to be as nice as possible. He blocked me, Dave Rubin blocked me. Yeah. So like, what, what do you think that is? Or do you think that like, are there any gurus that are better than others that like, where they're willing to have those conversations but it seems like for as much as they're out there because it seems like one of the ideas is like oh hey let's let's share ideas and all these other things they're really very they're really sensitive if that's you know <laughs> that's the only thing i can think of is like it feels like they're very very sensitive and i guess i get it because if, I, i'm sure they get a bunch of people just harassing them all day so they might have that quick trigger finger to block but at a certain point i'm like wow that was really like that was very minor watching you block this person or even a wonderful person like myself. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes you're clearly not a troll. I can see that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, um, yeah, no, I mean, look, yeah, it's true. You've got to make allowances for, for, for Twitter and social media. Um, and, and if someone's a bit famous, then um, they could, uh, you know, you, gotta, you, you make some allowances, but I still think what you say is true. Um, they do tend to have some thin skins. They do tend to react extraordinarily strongly to criticism. And I don't see them ever compromising. Um, and so, you know, I think that fits with the guru kind of thing. Like you cannot, like in a, in a traditional kind of cult or a religious movement, mm -hmm. you, you cannot criticize the leader, right? It's, the, it's his way or the highway. And yeah. um, that's that's how they work. Um, you know, if you praise the leader and you do and you do and you subscribe to everything 100 percent and you're an enthusiastic repeater of of their ideas, then you'll get praised and be, being described as, you know, super insightful and, and someone who, who really sees further than most and so on. And if you disagree, then, you know, at first they might make a big deal of being disappointed in you and it's such a shame you know and you, you see i mean not all of them are equal right i mean you know we're not we're not putting people into a 
like a like a flat category in which everyone is the same. So you know, to his credit, someone um, like um, oh uh, Sam Harris, yeah, you know, um, has been good. And Nassim Taleb, even though he is something of an obnoxious ass, um, is t- to his credit not um, not not someone who participates in that kind of back scratching, back padding yeah. thing and and seems to just, you know, have his he'll have his own take on whatever. And um so he so he's quite willing to criticize other gurus too. Um and you know you see the reactions to that. Like it's not it's not they don't react well. Um mm-hmm. so they people various characters. Um Claire Lehman, for instance, is is a kind of a um an editor of Quillette magazine um, yeah. an Australian who was associated with some you know somewhat right wing views in some respects, but has been become recently increasingly disenchanted yeah. around co- especially driven by COVID because of of where a lot of the gurus have gone. She hasn't been shy about her criticism. Her criticisms have been valid on this topic totally mm-hmm. valid and expressed quite well but they she was she's immediately portrayed as someone who was mis, for mysterious reasons kind of gone crazy or succumbed to yeah the, I, you, it, you know, it, that's been interesting to watch <laughs> it, it, yeah so so much so much for heterodoxy right you know yeah. you, you you need to be on board with it or you'll get excluded pretty quick. And, you know, the same thing happened to Sam Harris when, when yeah. he criticized them on those grounds as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, speaking of, let's, let's, let's talk Rogan for just a little bit because this week, the last two weeks, I guess, have been just absolutely insane with all the controversy around Spotify and everything. But uh, Joe Rogan, he, you know, addressed it. A lot of people are like, I, I think I replied to Chris, like a lot of people are kind of uh, uh, seeing it as an apology. I just kind of saw it as him like addressing it not really like apologizing. He's like, hey, here are my thoughts on it and all this. But even I think, uh, I think Sam Harris, yeah, Sam Harris even like, oh, hey, good on Joe for doing this. But something that you guys pointed out that like, I, I like I, I saw it, but I didn't really recognize it was that uh, people like Joe Rogan who say, hey, I'm just, I'm in the middle. I just ask questions, but it's always one pointing at one direction. And something that, I've noticed, and I, I wrote about it was just for example, when he had uh, Malone and McCullough on during, I, I listened to both three hour episodes. There was this like idea that nobody listens to it and they just yeah. criticize. But I'm like, no, I spent six hours of my life. <laughs> but anyways, that's why yeah. we should pull the club. <laughs> but, uh, maybe you've noticed this too, since you've had to listen to these, but when he has those guys on who agree with his opinions, that uh, his little assistant, Jamie, like doesn't even exist. There's no fact checking, nothing, right? I think uh, maybe in the McCullough one, there was like one fact check, right? But then when he had uh, Josh Zepps on, I counted it and he fact checked Josh like four or five times within the first half hour, right? Yeah. yeah. So when Joe, this is where that idea of self-deception comes in because when Joe addressed this situation, he's like, hey, I just bring people on with different opinions and I try to, you know, push back and challenge, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem like he realizes, like if, I I think if he quantified how often he fact checked people, like, I wonder if that would like give him an aha moment or he just, he has that biased blind spot. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Cause it's, it's interesting to watch. Oh, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, (laughs) Uh, yeah, so, so look, Joe Rogan's often described as a big dummy, and when it comes to his epistemics, he certainly is, right? He's someone who struggles. He's someone who believed the moon landing was a hoax. He's vulnerable to conspiracy theories, and he's, he's just not very good at, at getting his head around um, scientific <laughs> reality-based things. That being said, he's got great instincts. Yeah, he's, he's got great social intelligence, and mm-hmm. he... Uh, he and that apology video was extremely well crafted. Um, as you said, it's 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 sorry, not sorry, right? Yeah. He's, he 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 doesn't he's not he doesn't really apologize for anything. It's a defense and a justification, and as you say, it's quite misleading. Yeah, because because he presents. I mean, like it comes across really well. It comes across as big hearted. As look, I'm just this guy. I'm trying to make his podcast. It's become really successful. I like talking to people because it's interesting to talk to people. I'm not very prepared a lot of the time. I'm just trying to figure stuff out. I've got an open mind, 
And, you know, if, if you take him at face value, he's made a few missteps and people are jumping on him for, for getting it wrong, right? Yeah. Now, as you say, that's not true, right? That's not a fair reflection of what he's actually been doing. When he has someone who is presenting like an orthodox view um, and not crazy conspiracy theories, yeah. he's fact-checking them at a mile a minute. He's evincing extreme skepticism. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't come to the party just with, with, with no background. In fact, after, like in the apology video, he mentioned how he enjoyed his talk with, and I've forgotten the name. Um, uh, Sanjay Gupta? Sanjay Gupta, thank you. He said, oh, I enjoyed that. I got a lot out of that talk. He, he was crowing about owning Sanjay Gupta. Yeah. He disagreed <laughs> with Sanjay. He said, I've, he's got a folder uh, labeled cooties with, with all of the research, <laughs> yeah. right? And yeah. he said, oh, Sanjay Gupta thought he was going to come and kind of just like explain stuff to me. But I, I, you know, he was surprised because I knew stuff. I had it all figured out. So he, he was not coming. So that was someone representing just a normal <laughs> worldview, right? And, and Rogan was coming to it, not as not as just a guy having a conversation or someone who is, you know, doesn't have any dog in the fight, but as someone, as, as an activist, right? Someone with strong pre-existing worldviews and, and he felt that he had won that debate against yeah. Sanjay Gupta. When he, and when he comes to McCulloch and Malone, as you say, there's no fact-checking. He's, he's, he asks these leading questions, these breathless leading questions, mm-hmm. which basically presume that everything they've said is right. You know, he calls them. You're saying that people need to rise up, in you know, at, at this, at the, at, at the terrible stuff that's going on. Um, he he basically is on board, like a hundred percent on board. So he's not a disinterested person on on certain yeah. topics. Look, that being said, like a lot of people defending Joe, sort of remember Joe Rogan from a lot of his other podcasts. You know, and he's done podcasts on all kinds of, you know, he's done all kinds of interviews on all yeah. kinds of stuff. And you know, he could do on on topics that are not connected to one of his conspiracy theories or are not connected with one of like he's he's very political character as well um just a separate topic if it's not connected to political polarization or conspiracy theories then um he's perfectly he's fine you know what i mean he he is um, but on these topics it's it's really quite dangerous um and i find it quite frustrating because um the question of whether or not, say, Spotify should continue its, you know, hundred contract worth hundreds of millions of dollars, or whether mm-hmm. it should exert any kind of like restrictions on what Joe does, um, is presented as well. That's censorship, right? So you just got to, well, it, I there's difficult questions around this, but it's not censorship. Censorship is done by the government, right? Saying that it's illegal, mm-hmm. right, to say such a thing. Like it, it is not. Cent- not not censoring doesn't mean that a company or a person is obligated to participating in spreading like very dangerous health misinformation. Yeah. So, which is basically what you're saying to someone like Spotify. So it's perfectly okay, I would say, for for Spotify to choose to withdraw from that relationship because the, the, they shouldn't be obligated to help Joe spread um, ideas which you know have been proven to directly lead to death. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when it, uh, you know, going back to the whole fact checking thing, I think when I first started noticing this and I wanted to like start keeping track because, uh, you know, um, I used to listen to Rogan a lot more, but as soon as I saw him like kind of going down this path, it was even pre COVID. I was like, I kind of see your like mm, slant. But anyways, when he had Malone on and Malone was saying that hospitals are getting paid $3,000 for like every COVID death and they're like covering them up and like saying like a gunshot wound is a COVID death. And Joe Wilgen didn't even blink. He didn't say like, wait, really? Like, do you have any proof? He did just nothing. I'm like, you're just letting all of this information just wash over you as, as though it's fact, no matter how out there, you know, it is. And, and yeah, it's, it's been really interesting. And, and like you said, uh, uh, when he had Sanjay Gupta on, and I'm curious, I'm curious too, because this seems like a broader societal problem, right? Because uh, a lot of this has to do with like intellectual humility, right? It's it's something that I never had until I got sober, when I realized like, hey, maybe I don't know everything, right? But it's not just these gurus, it's not just the hosts, but the people listening, uh, I'm sure you get it all the time. You're <laughs> You're an academic, you have years of experience, you have Twitter randos just coming to you, calling you an idiot, right? 
have, have you noticed this? And what do you and do you think like it's it's the internet and the availability of information? Like, what's making people think that they're so damn smart that they're like just like, oh, did you see me own that PhD person? <laughs> Even though I'm just some like guy who like sits in my house, like it's like I'm a college dropout, and I recognize that. I read, I do what I can, but. It's just interesting when I see people think that they just took down someone who's been researching for decades, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, yeah, so one nuance to that is there are a bunch of people with PhDs and academics, who, including me, that are by no means brilliant or super <laughs> smart, smarty pants. So, you know, the, um, so, you know, it's not like, it's not like, uh, yeah, so I don't want to imply that you know, unless you've got whatever um, credentials or something. Like yeah, that. not um, not the elitism and all yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's not right. Um, but, um, yeah, we're look, look, look. In some sense, none of it's new. I mean, like say Joe Rogan talking conspiracy theories with pals, or talking about how the America's going to hell in a handbasket because of the the lefties or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. That those sorts of conversations happen on people's back porches all the time, and have always happened long before the internet came along. But but the thing that um, social media and the internet generally has has done is it's it's done this great leveling, where mm. where there are no there are, uh, there is less and less and you know the the inner the inner workings of institutions are, are more and, and the details that there's more and more information and, and there's more information about how the sausage is made, so yeah, perhaps a lot of the mystique that um, might have previously been attached. Mm -hmm to these institutions has evaporated um but it's like a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing like you know the you know like there'll be some email or some document you know that serve you know that you know and you know like heaps of dumb stupid stuff happens in government universities of course it does yeah you know what i mean yeah um and and you know so but of course the worst of the worst is, is what will come out and so there's this I, there's a decrease in confidence in institutions mm -hmm. Um, but I think that misses the big picture. Like if you look at the, at the progress that's occurred over the last 300 years, mm. right? It, it's happened due to these technocratic systems, um, you know, whether it's a, you know, national healthcare system or, or whether it's a, a research institutes or whatever. I mean, the fact that we, um, you know, most of us in the first world are, are living extraordinarily comfortable lives compared to mm -hmm. is due to these institutions and they haven't really changed but our perception of them has changed um so as well as that obviously the internet gives every single person a platform and we all have an equal opportunity to make our voice heard now in that kind of environment it is not the most qualified the most expert guy or, or girl who is there busy researching away, writing their papers for journals, right? Working in the lab, mm -hmm. collecting data, doing statistics. These people don't have the skills or the time to become a big hit yeah. on the internet, right? If you look at the people who become a big hit on the internet, these are the people who don't do that stuff. These are mm -hmm. the people who spend all their time focusing and, and building skills on becoming a big hit on the internet, yeah. right? which is exactly what these people specialize in. So, um, yeah, it kind of, um, yeah, I, if I, if I could just wave a magic wand and see one sort of, sort of change in sort of public awareness, I, it would be that it would be, you know, if we could just get a greater awareness that the people who specialize in sounding convincing in, in sounding, um, trustworthy in, in, um, in, saying things that feel intuitively and emotionally appealing yeah just you know please raise your skepticism bar for those people and maybe give some time just pay attention to the to the the voices that are actually real like it, whatever the topic is let's say it's a scientific topic yeah pay attention to the people with the genuine expertise because they're out there they're just not the loudest voices and, and they may not have the glamour and the charisma yeah that these other people have yeah no that's uh that's literally one of the reasons i started this podcast i just have this natural curiosity uh, curiosity i read these books from academics from like you know these uh publishers that just publish those books but i want the average person to hear about these topics because there's a lot of 
very important work going on, especially all the people researching polarization, misinformation, stuff going on. Like there's a lot of people researching this stuff, but like you said, it's hard to find that combination of someone who's doing the hard research and they're also very charismatic and out there and doing these things. It's almost like we need to like pair up researchers with their own like PR person who can go out there and, and do this stuff. But, you know, uh, so, something I want to ask, like going back to kind of the Spotify and Joe Rogan conversation, since since you you guys have a growing podcast that, you know, it's gained a lot of traction, especially during COVID with all this stuff going on. But uh, just your thoughts around like responsibility as a host, right? Because Joe Rogan's always like, hey, don't listen to me. I'm just, I'm just a guy with a podcast, you know, I never knew it would get this big, you know? Um, and, uh, I saw this with, you know, uh, when my YouTube channel blew up too, because when you cover something and I'm sure you guys take this into consideration, which is why I respect that you guys like, don't try to try not to go too hard on people is your fans can just go after someone and harass them. Right. So, um, you know, Joe Rogan, like, I, like I get it because there's this invisible line that you cross where when you guys first started your podcast, right? Like how many listeners did you have yeah. compared yeah. to now? And there's this line that you cross and nobody knows where that line is, where now you have a big audience. Now you have a certain amount of influence. So how much responsibility do you see like someone having uh, for their audience? Like how much do you and Chris take that into consideration? How much do you see uh, some of these gurus like, what responsibility do they have to get out the right information, say the right things, not send their audience to go attack people that they might be covering? You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I I think yeah. Look, I think it, we everyone has that responsibility. Um, I agree with you there. Um, and we hadn't really thought about it either, as you said, because at the big we didn't expect to get big um yeah. or bigger <laughs> we expect it to be this super niche type thing <laughs> and continue that way um and it it becomes more of an issue when one is cover one brings up someone who was a smaller figure yeah and doesn't and do like so if it's someone who's really big then even if you have a reasonably big audience then then it's like little flea bites you know what i mean that there's, there's, there's this public it's like it's like saying um you know biden's a you know, senile, you know, he's an yeah. old idiot, right? I mean, you know, Biden doesn't care, right? There's he, there's, a, there's a million other people saying that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like we, we struck this when we were covering Gad Sad, actually, and along the way, he, we, his, in his material, he was doing an interview with um, another, um, you know, um, YouTuber um, a podcaster called Chris Williamson. Mm. Okay, so, so um, in that podcast, um, in our view, Chris was being quite credulous and just kind of lapping up everything that Gadside was saying enthusiastically, even when, in our view, Gadside was saying the most <laughs> stupid, self-aggrandizing yeah. nonsense, right? Um, so, um, so we uh, criticized Chris quite strongly using strong language, and you know, it was kind of tongue in cheek, and we we we. we so we did we did say stuff like oh no no that's too mean or whatever but we did you know it's meant to be a fun relaxed kind of podcast and we're, we're, we let ourselves be a little bit snarky there so chris we got in touch with chris, chris williamson got in touch and um, eventually came and come on to have a talk with us about the effect that that had on him mm. because a lot of people that he other you know podcasters other people in the community that he respected a lot listen to our podcast and listen to us basically laughing and and making you know and 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 so he um so he made a, a very good defense of himself you know acknowledged you know where and uh, the, the point the some, you know many of the underlying points we were making uh, acknowledged mm -hmm. the the truth in them and for our part we um you know acknowledged that you know we sort of went a little bit too far you know we didn't it didn't really cross our mind that yeah having a bit of fun there would have had um a, an impact on this character chris Williams. he wasn't even the main topic of the show it was meant to be about gats said yeah so yeah look i mean it's just one so look by the way we're still in touch with chris williams and so the outcome of that was super positive mm. right because he's he's you know i don't i don't ha i have a very different worldview from <laughs> from chris i think right yeah. um, but i you know he he seems to be uh, a, a nice guy who is um is trying his best and he's certainly very um pleasant and um approachable so um you know i think that and i, th I think that there's some something positive comes out of 
us having this continuing dialogue with him, even though we kind of live in completely different worlds. Like he, he's kind of in the yeah. sort of influencer type young men, you know, how to be attractive to women kind, <laughs> yeah. of, kind of field. Um, so it's like different worlds, but you know, that's, that's a healthy thing. So look, I look, I don't basically, my answer is, I don't know. Um, we're, we're just trying to navigate it like everyone else. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's weird too, because uh, you know, the other thing that the internet does is you never know when something's just going to go viral, right? Like you could just make something very small or, or say, for example, like, cause you know, like if you're punching up, up, right but all of a sudden if that episode goes viral now all of a sudden you punching up turns into punching down and yeah. it's a difficult thing and I, I hope people in the audience understand that aspect too because those of us who create content you never know what's gonna just kind of explode and like oh crap I wish I could have gone back and been a little bit more careful or <laughs> you yes. know or, or whatever because I yeah I've, I've seen that happen one too many times but um you know uh with with the whole misinformation thing to um like i've had uh, you know a lot of people on here who write about you know freedom of speech and all this other stuff and you know drown out uh bad ideas with good ideas and all that kind of stuff and you know that i guess that's one of the reasons why i appreciate your guys podcast because you point out the flaws in each individual argument and i think that's like the best thing, right? Like I would, I would ask everybody who gets infected by one of these gurus to listen to your guys' episode to get a little bit of the antidote. But, you know, you kind of mentioned that, you know, Spotify does, you know, they don't have to promote this, this kind of information. And I, I'm just, I'm just curious, like, uh, you know, your overall thoughts, right? Because it seems like, I'll give you an example that you can, that you'll, you know, be able to relate to. When, when COVID started, before the uh, social media platforms really purged QAnon, uh, this QAnon YouTuber, he made a video, all these crazy COVID conspiracy theories. This was even before vaccines, right? And I made a video debunking it, right? Pointing out his bad arguments, what's bad science, all these other things. And YouTube wrongfully gave my channel a strike and took the video down, right? I appealed it to a human. Uh, the human said, nope, we stand by it. And it took me getting my media contacts to pressure YouTube in order to reverse it. So I guess when I see, you know, this idea of like, uh, you know, um, uh, platforms controlling what, what misinformation is, I'm like, with these algorithms still like in their infancy, I don't really trust that. So that's one of my concerns. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of where I, I stand. And I, I get curious because I think there are podcasts like yours where you make valid points, even though I don't think a lot of Joe Rogan's audience is coming over to see what you guys have to say or whatever. But uh, what, what are your kind of like overall thoughts? Like, do you think that there's a downside if Spotify were to remove that? Do you think that could affect other you know like have some like uh collateral damage you know what i mean yeah yeah no look it's a it's a interesting problem i think um so yeah look first of all that happens to everyone right like like i like chris chris kavanaugh was just complaining like like he was saying he's a very sarcastic person and he he was saying very sarcastically oh yes and the and fauci was you know you know conspired to kill people and you know it this very sarcastic thing and and he got a you know got a you know a twitter thing you know what i mean yeah. so he had to delete that you know what i mean he could have appealed it but it would have taken weeks you know so so that so the algorithms that w whatever they try to do which we know they're going to do in an automated kind of way because they they can't spend the money to have you know yeah. have legions of human beings reviewing every little thing are always going to be imperfect right but so it is just one of those trade-offs you know, where like for every kind of unfair strike that someone like yourself or Chris might get, you know, there, there might be, you know, a thousand ac true positives, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's really, but that's, that's like a technical question, right? Mo people also have a problem with the tech companies being the ones who decide, you mm -hmm. know, which is, which is a very reasonable concern to have. And one, one that I've voiced myself um, previously very strongly. Um, Look, but I think the thing to acknowledge is, and you know, look, everyone likes free speech. Free speech is a good thing, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's, it's, it's like democracy. Democracy is a good thing, right? Yeah. We, we all agree on that. Um, but, you know, we have democracy, but we don't have 
direct democracy. Like we don't have people voting on every single, like with a plebiscite on every single, on their smartphones, on every single little decision. We have representative democracy, which is actually slightly less democratic mm -hmm. right, than the other one, but it's universally acknowledged to just work better right mm -hmm. now the same goes for free speech like people even people that are very strongly in favor of free speech and even free speech absolutists many of which would not have a problem say with spotify not hosting a podcast on holocaust denialism for instance mm -hmm. right or would not you know it's the fire and the crowded theater type idea as well people do not have a problem with with actual direct exhortations to commit violence Right. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, people don't have a problem with, you know, deplatforming or preventing the, the spread or, you know, the 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 um, the advertisement or propaganda for stuff, say, um, promoting uh, health treatments. Yeah. Snake oil stuff like there's, mm -hmm. you know, there are there are dangerous products that some people people will try to monetize and sell that are dangerous to people. Yeah. So so people so even people that are really, you know, not really strongly on that line do not have a problem with those things so there clearly is always a line and mm -hmm. so i think the question always is does this material cross cross the red line and uh look in, in my view you know rogan's recent stuff um McCullough malone this it is it is full ball um uh, paranoid conspiratorial yeah. um anti-vax misinformation that mm -hmm is it's it's different from say believing that the moon landing was a hoax because it there is a direct uh um uh inference about yeah. your health decisions right Go, running out and buying buying ivermectin right instead of getting vaccinated um is killing people in the yeah. united states where vaccination rates are quite low so um so i don't think any of us should just try to i mean it's very tempting to go for a sort of an absolutist or kind of rights based position because it's simple and easy. You say, you know, you know, I you know, disagree with what you say, but I'll defend the death of your right to say it, you know, mm. and just to take that thing. But really what that is, is avoiding the issue. And it's inconsistent because because there's always there are always things that are beyond the pale. The, the tough problem that we need to embrace is that is is, is we have to figure out where, where that line is about where where the boundary of reasonable fair spe even speculation and so on is and yeah. what lies beyond it and i'm not pretending it's an easy question i'm not pretending there isn't sort of costs and benefits mm -hmm. um but i think we need to accept it yeah so i i, I just got a few more questions for you matt but let me let me ask you this so let's let's imagine let's let's imagine that Joe Rogan was the person he thinks he is, right? He just has people on from <laughs> both sides of arguments. He pressures them both. Like if if he like let's say he had Malone and McCullough on, and he challenged them for three hours straight, right? Where's your evidence? Where did that study come from? Hey, did you know that that study was debunked? Hey, that uh, you know that 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 uh, place that did that research, they're some fringe like Christian group that nobody respects, right? Let's say he pushed them like super hard. Then, like, do you think that would be acceptable, right? Like, if it was being challenged, because it does. Like, I see what you're saying when it has like the whole like, oh just come here and just say everything that you want and I'll just agree with you. Like that's dangerous. But if he was challenging it the way that we would hope he would, do you think that that changes that a little bit? You know what I mean? Because now you have the misinformation, but you don't have somebody who's just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, there's different bars, is there, when you say acceptable? Like, do I think it's a good idea? Do I think it's mm -hmm. a helpful thing? Do I think it's a positive thing? Do I think it should be allowed? You know what I mean? Or allowed in yeah. by Spotify. So there's a whole different ways to answer that, right? Mm -hmm. um, look, I think, yeah, depending on the topic, having um, crazies on <laughs> to, <laughs> to uh, challenge them can be a good idea. Like, if their ideas are already spreading, you know, already very prevalent and a lot mm. of people are buying into them, then um, it may well be helpful to have them on debate. I'm, I'm actually, I'm not a big fan of debate culture. Me neither. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, cause, because the thing is, is that people that are pushing this information are generally very good at, at a whole bunch of rhetorical techniques. Yeah. That, um, that means that the debate gives this, doesn't really like the, 
yeah look it, what, what would what we'd all like to be true is that there's this open marketplace of ideas right yeah. and 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 the idea and good ideas and bad ideas sort of rub up against each other and come into competition and the good ideas win out because they're supported by evidence and are more reasonable and coherent that's what mm -hmm. we'd like to be true um unfortunately it's just not the case propaganda and misinformation is intuitively and emotionally compelling yeah and people who are promoting it are often very good at a variety of rhetorical techniques like gish galloping mm -hmm. and, or, or using the sciencey sounding language make, making up terms like mass formation yeah. psychosis yes so you know it's it's a tough one um yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I, I, I a thousand percent agree. And I, I never have a good way of phrasing this, but I, I, it just feels like a lot, there's a lot of really dumb people where like the bad ideas are going to win out because they're emotionally driven and everything like that. But like, even with the Gish Gallup, I wrote a, a, a Substack piece where, you know, I think, I think the first episode of yours that I listened to was when uh, you were covering uh, Rogan. I think it was when he had Jocko on before you guys did the follow up with McCullough and Malone and stuff. But anyways, uh, I, 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 so I personally started like with, with a lot of the current mandates and the way the science has been kind of updated. And we know that Omicron's like breaking through the vaccines and everything, you know, and then seeing people still like acting like we're still like pre-vaccine era kind of, you know, I, I had this kind of a little bit of skepticism and that's when the McCullough episode came out and it was just three hours of this guy saying all these sciencey things. He has a computer there with so many studies and just because like, uh, you know, I, I know there's like truth default theory, but like I'm the opposite. I'm skeptical of everyone at first until they prove themselves. So I was like, this guy just said this stuff for three hours. And unless I go do some more research, there's no way if I'll know that he's, he, you know, whether yeah. he's saying is, is true no. or not. And, uh, it, and that's what's difficult is a lot of people aren't, you know, I'm not special. I'm just a really big skeptic, <laughs> but a lot of people aren't going to listen to a three hour Rogan podcast and go try to disprove like no. uh, Donald right. Trump was great at that technique, right? You'd have to you'd have to spend hours fact checking everything he said in ninety seconds. <laughs> yeah, know? so yeah. It's really difficult. Yeah, yeah in, in a way, the the sort of um, the sort of this, the heterodox and free speech absolutist kind of point of view is is caveat emptor, right? Like if you you know these are, this is just a guy telling you his ideas, having this conversation. If you're if you're dumb enough to believe that, then that's on you. Right, yeah. you you need to take responsibility for your own decisions and your own opinions. Right, mm -hmm. it's very much a self responsibility model. Right, but as you say, it's not reasonable to expect a casual listener to Joe Rogan to be able to debunk and see what's wrong. Yeah, with with a lot of that gish galloping assertions that are made by someone like Malone or McCullough, who are very practiced at speaking in a sciencey way have all of these basically it is spurious misinformation that they're presenting but it is superficially extremely compelling and sounds very sciencey now you you may be the sort of person who goes out and searches like a um a debunking done by someone who is 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 better at that kind of thing mm -hmm. um that there is an account called debunk the funk which i really yeah no, he's great he's great and and he does do that um but you know it's not reasonable in my view to expect all of us to to be have to do that all the time um it's the same way like if, if you go to the chemist and you and you you're, you're looking for some sort of thing for a headache right yeah it shouldn't be on you to go do i need to check that this doesn't have arsenic in it mm. and, and, and so on yeah. like every time um you know there are so you know i guess i'm a look i'm, I'm a milk toast kind of centristy um, <laughs> in, in many in many ways but i guess that's where i land on this um yeah yes you know speculation's good it's it's okay it's you know disagreement um and yeah. people who counteract the mainstream that's fine that's good by, by all means let a thousand flowers bloom but um please let's let's have some <laughs> yeah we, 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 we can't have no standards whatsoever yeah no it's it's why i'm always i'm always torn on this this type of thing because i know it's it's just 
it, it's ridiculous to expect people to do that kind of research all the time. And I think that's a great analogy. Like, you know, am I going to check, double check my medication every time? Like, you know, we all have lives. We have, you know, we have kids, we have jobs, we have all these things. Most people are listening to this on their way to work or while they're yeah. working out, they're not going to go home and like, <laughs> you know, and I'm, it's just like, I'm just naturally like, oh, let's see what they have to say. But anyways, one of the last things I wanted to talk to you about, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I've been curious, uh, is Russell Brand. All right. So you guys covered him a long time ago. And just my brief history with Russell Brand. I was never like a huge fan of his like comedy and like movies and stuff like that. But when I got sober early in my sobriety, I found out he was sober. He released his book. I was like two or three years sober. He released his book Recovery. And I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the way he covered the 12 steps because a lot of people have misconceptions, all that kind of stuff. But kind of what you guys talk about in your episode about him, which focused on his kind of like spirituality aspect. Uh, yeah. He gets like really out there and like says all these things and like goes round and round. And that's, that's where I'm like, all right, Russell, calm down. But anyways, you guys covered Russell a while ago. And I like, I don't know if you guys have been keeping up, but I have his like YouTube channel in, in front of me. And since then, it seems like he's, he's almost like JP Sears version 2.0, right? <laughs> like everything's questioning the establishment big pharma uh one of his newest videos that has a million views is defending joe rogan and all these other things and and like it it's breaking my heart it is breaking my heart matt because of the good that i know russell could do i used to recommend his book recovery when i was yeah. working at a drug and alcohol rehab i'm like read this read this yeah. so to see him it feels like he's chasing that kind of you know like oh ooh, ooh, if i do this kind of content so, so yeah, I don't know if you've been keeping up with it. Is there a, a second Russell Brand episode coming? What are your, what are your thoughts on the, the route Russell's been going? Uh, look, I think a second Russell Brand episode is definitely warranted. Yeah, I've seen the same kind of thing you have there and Chris has too. And uh, yeah, it's wild, isn't it? Um, look, Russell Brand, like he, he always had that aspect to him, right? He's this sort of poet, poetic, spiritual, fast talking kind of free association, yeah. you know, crazy wisdom, right? And, you know, sometimes that's, that's cool. You know, like if you're talking, you know, if, especially, you know, might be talking about your personal experiences with addiction and stuff like that and sharing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people can get, you know, insights from that and it can't, it work, it can work, you know, and I, I, you know, I'd say the same of Jordan Peterson, you know, like if, yeah. if when Jordan Peterson, you know, back 12 rules for life and he's talking that, that kind of, you mm -hmm. know, self-responsibility, you know, you know, put yourself up by your bootstraps kind of thing. If you're, a, if you're a, you know, you could be a person at a certain time of life struggling with certain things and that language can can speak to you. Um, it, it doesn't always mean that that modality is going to, you know, it's not a, it, it can lead, if you start talking about more scientific type things or naturalistic, materialistic things, that, that approach, that poetic kind of yeah. approach can lead you up the garden path. Now, but garden, um, um, he, Russell Brand is such an interesting character because he, he's, he, like J.P. Sears, um, he's 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 sort of part of this sort of weird horseshoe type thing. Yeah, that, yep, exactly. That's going on, and you know, there's another podcast called Conspirituality, which is a, a very good one, which which covers this sort of inter this sort of um, intersection between sort of natural wellness and spirituality mm -hmm. and alternative health and so on, and this weird kind of paleo conservatism. Uh, you know, quite. A, quite like this new form of conservatism like i'm yeah, not talking really I'm, I'm not talking about you know ronald reagan type conservatism i'm talking about this kind of really weird kind of you know you only eat red meat and you know you know men need to do this and women need to do that and yeah. it's it, it's it, it's a new thing and and so russell brand you know as you say sort of he's you know was you know was always this kind of free thinker and anti-institutional kind of person very much mm -hmm. skeptical of mainstream narratives and that but sort of coming from that sort of this like revolutionary leftish kind of point of view and mm -hmm. what he's quite easily transitioned to that sort of paranoid right and what it, to, to my mind it's really just an example of how the political landscape has shifted and it is not so much a kind of your sort of left-wing right-wing thing anymore yeah. it's actually more that that there is this um very strange kind of new kind of anti-institution anti-establishment hyper skeptical conspiratorial don't trust you know any of them 
type thing and it is anti-scientific as well even though many of them do pay lip service to a scientific worldview yeah. i mean um um brett brett weinstein is the perfect example of this and heather hang too who who present themselves as being these exemplars of, of good scientific thinking mm-hmm. but actually what they have um is this is this naturalistic natural is best essentially woo kind of yeah. kind of um thing so um so yeah it concerns me um and um it's um russell brand is just such a fascinating character um and yeah he's he's another a case where I think the, there's an interplay with the kind of person who becomes a guru or is susceptible to these things. I mean, mm-hmm. Russell Brand, as just the kind of guy he is, I think it, you can see how yeah. he's susceptible. Yeah, it's really it's really weird too because he's very uh self he's like self aware of it because a lot of us addicts and stuff like we think we're you know we think we're you know super like great and all these other we think a lot and he'll call himself out on that. But then it seems like he also plays into it. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, just that kind of la- uh, kind of one of the last things I want to touch on that I was just thinking of is like, there's this really fine line. Like I am like a left leaning liberal progressive. Like I wanted Bernie Sanders to be president. I think big pharma, like, cause my drug was prescription uh, opioids, right? So I'm like skeptical of big pharma and uh, you know, the, 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 the weight that they put on our government to like <laughs> all these other yeah. things, right? So I'm so skeptical of them right but there's there's a whole group of people like me where it seems like there's this fine line where they can dip into that kind of conservatism that you're talking about where it quickly became like nope don't trust any science don't trust any institution where like so it went from like this skepticism to this absolute like oh the government's trying to control you they're trying to make you do this don't like you you guys talked about this with jp sears and I, I had no idea, by the way, when I heard uh, Chris on Megan Downs' podcast, I was like, wait, did you say JP Sears, like the guy who made those funny YouTube videos? I had no idea. And I was showing my girlfriend. And but it's weird. Like, have you noticed that how some liberals have had this kind of horseshoe where they dip? And it's weird, too, with all the polarization, that this is kind of the thing that has <laughs> brought the two sides together. You know, like now you have like conservatives and liberals who are like anti-vax or whatever. But yeah, I, I'm curious what what that is. Oh man, I mean that's that's like a that's a huge topic in itself, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's um it's kind of the direction the modern world is going. I mean, look, I, I'm no political scientist or anything, so that's how <laughs> I you know feel. But I mean, it does seem that there's a big um political reorientation going on. You know, yeah. like like left leaning parties used to be the parties of you know the working class or whatever against big companies and corporations and 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 so on. Um, and yet, and the right wing used to be like you know responsibility, you know, um, you know, conform to the you know what what the the system is telling you to do, you know what I mean, um, mm-hmm. and so on. Um, and that 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 there's that reorientation where the right has become much more populist and and more institutional, and and the left has become more sort of statist if you like more more kind mm-hmm. of like and also the party of you know professionals and academics and and people like that who are part of the system right so um yeah it's a confusing time to be thinking about politics i mean mm-hmm. I, um so yeah look um look my my sympathies look i'm, I'm just i think my advice for most people look, look is I, I think you've been saying the same thing which is that yes it's good to be skeptical yeah you know, institutions and the system does get it wrong heaps, you know, the, the Tuskegee, you know, um, mm-hmm. experiments is a terrible example. The, the opioid academ- uh, epidemic in the United States, another huge failing, right, mm-hmm. of, of regulation and, and, you know, pharma and so on. You know, we could make a great big list of all the ways in which our, you know, the, the liberal systems that we and, and institutions that we've created have failed, right? Even mm-hmm. on COVID, right? There's a nice big list of things where they've gotten a bunch of things wrong. Um, but I think perfection, you know, perfection is, we shouldn't expect that, you know, yeah. you know, um, like think about the conduct of World War II, right? It was, it was just one huge mistake after the, the, mm-hmm. the next, you know, because in an unfolding um, emergency, it's very difficult to get everything right all the time. 
Um, so it's just about getting that balance right. Um, like when it comes to skepticism, yes, be appropriately skeptical, um, but not conspiratorial and paranoid. Yeah. You know? and, and about your institutions, yes, you know, hold their feet to the fire when they get stuff wrong and demand, you know, reforms and changes and for them not to make that mistake again, by all means, be an activist in that sense. But I'm not a, I think, um, I think a revolution where we burn it all down, dismantle <laughs> the institutions. And by the yeah. way, you know, as you sort of said, you know, this sort of reorientation, like the left and the right do this, yeah? Abolish the police, yeah. you know? You've got the left saying abolish the police. You've got the right saying we need to abolish the universities, right? The, yeah. the common populist thread is kind of just burn it all down and sort of start again. Um, look, I, I suggest that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it took a it took a while to get all these things organized, and you know, <laughs> there's a lot of logistics to think of. But, but yeah, like, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess one of my favorite sayings I forgot where it originated was like, "Keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out." Right? That's like, yeah. have this kind of skepticism, but know know where the line is. Right? Like. Yep. Like, for example, I'm skeptical of big pharma and, you know, here in the States, they can do direct to consumer marketing, but like, I got my damn vaccine. Like, I'm not that skeptical. I'm like, okay, you know, these are, these are apples and uh, apples and oranges. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of nuance in these things, but yeah. But, but yeah. So uh, Matt, I, I've kept you here a very long time. I appreciate your time so much. I've been dying to have you on. So uh, yeah, for everybody listening who uh, is unfamiliar with it, where, where can they find you? follow the podcast, all that kind of good stuff. Okay, cool. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, look, it was awesome to be on here. I really enjoyed having this chat. It was great. Um, yeah, look, so our podcast is Decoding the Gurus. Um, the Twitter handle is Gurus Pod, I think. <laughs> I <forgot laughs> anyway, so I, I, I'm on Twitter under a pseudonym of Arthur C. Dent because Arthur Dent, the character from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is my spirit animal. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not really, um, um, I'm not really anonymous. Uh, and that'll do. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's how you can find our podcast and, um, yeah. Beautiful. Well, well, yeah. Thanks for coming on. And yeah, we'll do this. We'll do this again sometime after we get Russell Brand 2.0 and some other, some other episodes. Sounds good, Chris. Thanks, Matt.